Well, hello and welcome to Broadway Baptist Church today. My name's Rochelle and you are very welcome. We're in a series on Mark and today we will be looking at reactions to Jesus, mainly from chapter 5. But we begin today with a psalm of praise by David as he pours out worship and gratitude. Psalm 138. David cries out, I will praise you, Lord, with all my heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. I will bow down before your holy temple and will praise your name for your unfailing love and your faithfulness. For you have so exalted your solemn decree that it surpasses your fame. When I called, you answered me. You greatly emboldened me. As we begin our worship, I want to just pick up that last verse I read from the psalm. When I called, you answered me. You greatly emboldened me. It is a wonderful reminder, isn't it, that we are not alone in life. And that gives us courage to press in and press on. So let's pray. O God, who is greater than the most powerful forces in this world, enable us to be still and know that you are God. O Lord, who answers out of the whirlwind of everyday life, breathe in us your Holy Spirit to strengthen, comfort and guide us in the midst of the storm. O oh, still small voice, speak to us this hour that we might become makers of your peace in our homes, in our communities, in our world. We pray all this in the name of the one who calmed the raging sea. Amen. Well, last week in the service, we interviewed Susan Woolley, who has been our administrator until recently. And we include her interview today, although apologies for the sound quality. 
And that's followed by a song that means a lot to Susan at the moment and speaks of God's steadfast love. Susan has been our administrator. And uh, as you all know, she has come to an end with most of the role, still doing a little bit in this transition period. But it would be good to hear a little bit from her. Uh, so, Susan, you'll come up. It has been wonderful working with you. And, um, but, you're trying to move on. So, you started at the NHS, you came out, you worked with us, and you've gone back. Can you just tell us a little bit about that journey? So, most of you know me and will know my story, but um, I know a few new people, which is pretty good. So, a little bit of filling in. I was a midwife. Um, I did that career for 22 years. Um, the end of my career was hard going. As it is for many people in the NHS, it's a very tough profession to work in. And um, I had a spell of mental ill health. Um, after six months of sickness, I got back to work, and then I found out I had cancer. So I had another long spell of sickness of having operations to do with that. Um, and I got back to the NHS again, to middle three, was building up my hours, and I got to the point of thinking, I really don't want this. And so at that point, um, nearly four years ago now, I left. And I felt totally at peace about leaving. Um, it was the right thing to do. And then the job here came up, so I've been here, as you know. Um, but about the December of 2020, when the vaccination um, rollout started, I saw this little niggle, and it, it was a thought in the night. I, I found that God often speaks to me in night, at night time. If I'm not able to sleep, often it's then that I hear. And it's quite a whisper from God. And I really felt like I was being nudged to make some inquiries. Could I take part in the vaccination program? And sure enough, there were of people like me who had not long left the profession um, to go on the temporary register and to take up more of the vaccination. So that's a bit of fact to you. And I'll be honest with you, the first day that I started back and I uh, was there in front of the public I was doing hands-on skills, it just came back so easily. It was like I'd not been away. And um, yeah, at that moment I just thought, yeah, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And so I did the two roles for quite some time, about 10 months, maybe. Um, but yeah, I've got to the point now where I need to put on the So I have gone back to the NHS. Out of interest, how many of you have been either to the arena or to Midland House? Loads of you, yeah. So, pull the next slide up. This is just um, a little snapshot that we have. This is since moving to Midland House. We have done a loads number of vaccinations, totally 128,686. That was three weeks ago. And we're still doing regularly several hundred each day. So, it's a very busy place, but I'm loving it. Um, the, the whole atmosphere, the fact that we're all pulling together, the um, the small amount of responsibility that I have compared to my big responsibility that I have as a midwife is perfect. Really is. So, you're busy, you feel it's very well wanting. Is there any example or story you can tell us of the ways in which you see or sense God working through you in this new world? So, um, meeting the public, obviously that's a, a big part of the role and that's what we're there for. But our encounters with the public are very brief, as you all know if you've been there. <laughs> so those are really quick conversations. I don't get the chance to go into any depth with people, apart from being a friendly face and giving them the, the care that they expect. Um, what I thought I'm really being um, used by God in that situation is with other members of staff. And we do have time, because we're not as busy now as we were, the conversations I'm having with other members of staff are really who is sometimes very in-depth, um, and faith comes into it. Um, and just being a listening ear, everybody's got a story to tell about lockdown. People have been through such a traumatic time, with whatever their personal circumstances, and to have a listening ear of someone that's prepared to listen and to um, just give sympathy and understanding 
that's really a valuable, I think, for all of us there. We're all appreciating that. But why might we pray for you? So for these encounters, obviously, that I'm um, listening, that I'm tuned into what God would have me to say, um, in the busy times, that's um, you know, not, not as easy, and in the quiet times, it's easier. Um, I think for the future of the vaccination program, too, because it is uncertain. We, we don't know any more than the public know, more than about a day in advance. Um, sometimes it's the announcements on the press, and then people at work say, did you know we're doing this now? <laughs> Um, so, yeah, for the uncertainty that there is around the, um, the leads in the place, the management uh, are amazing. They've done an amazing job. And those statistics that are on the board, 50,000 people went through our doors during December when we had that push. And the people who organised them were so impressed with the way they got it all together. So, for, for wisdom and decision making, it's very important. Let's pray for Susan, shall we? God, I thank you for Susan and for the gifts you have given her, for her servant heart and her desire to follow your lead. Thank you that for those um, her presence amongst those staff and the people who will meet her. And however brief, may she be your light in that situation. We'll give her and Paul a sense of peace uh, now and for their future. And Lord, would you fill her afresh with your spirit? Would you bless her and enable her to be that blessing to others? In Jesus' name, Amen. Susan, we just want to bless you with a little gift, and you can tell you put that together because it's not right. <laughs> Bless you. Shall we just?
prayers of intercession. Psalm 30 verse 4. Weeping may last through the night, but joy comes with the morning. Dear Father God, your time is not the same as our time. Forgive us when we ask, when will the morning come? We humbly ask for the strength to wait for it. When will the morning come? We ask for our brothers and sisters suffering in conflict and fear in Ukraine, Afghanistan, Ethiopia, Tigray, Yemen, to name but a few. We ask for our Christian brothers and sisters who cannot worship you openly in North Korea, Nigeria, Somalia, Libya, Pakistan, Eritrea, Sudan, Yemen, Iran and India with Afghanistan topping the list. Protect them, we cry. We ask for our brothers and sisters who must decide on a daily basis whether they should eat or keep warm. When will the morning come? We ask for our young adults struggling under the weight of mental illness. Please, when will the morning come? For our family at Broadway, heal those who are sick and strengthen their carers. As the psalmist says, sing to the Lord, all of you godly ones, praise his holy name, for we know that you will hear our prayers. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Amen. As we think about trust in Jesus today, Our next song is one that means a lot to another member, Jean. Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a fortune. Of glory divine, head of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story. This is my song. This is 
Well, last week, John invited us to puzzle over the stories Jesus told, recorded in Mark 4. It's not just a puzzle over what Jesus meant, but it's a puzzle over who Jesus is in relation to those stories. And one question that has been asked regarding the mustard seed that grew into a mighty tree, the last of those stories, was, well, what were those seeds and plants like? Mustard in Israel is an invasive plant. It gets everywhere. But it is thought that the tree Jesus was referring to has seeds like this and grows into a large tree spanning 20 to 25 feet, of which this is just a small example. The pastor who picked these seeds tried to take them home, but in customs he had to declare the seeds, of course. And immigration said, sorry, I can't let you take those seeds in, because if they hit the ground, they will spread like wildfire. John left us with the image of small beginnings growing to great things. I want to add to that persistent, tenacious nature of the kingdom. Yet tiny beginnings, but once the kingdom takes root, you might not see it grow very much outwardly, but be sure it is growing. And once it has taken root, you can't easily get rid of it. We don't have mustard trees, but if you were to go out into the back garden of church and check out the borders, I'm afraid you will see brambles. They are taking over once again. Doesn't matter how much we try to cut them back or dig them out, they keep coming back. That is a picture of the kingdom, particularly in places where there has been persecution. China is a prime example. No matter how hard they tried to get rid of the church, it actually grew. And so we continue to pray for places like Afghanistan and North Korea, that the roots of the kingdom will continue to grow. So as we continue in Mark's Gospel, we follow on from Jesus' teaching. And for me, the series of events that follow this teaching are a demonstration of how little by little the kingdom is taking root through the authority and ministry of Jesus. The question is, how will people respond? And what is the soil that enables the kingdom to take root? We're actually going to do a whistle-stop tour from the end of chapter 4 to the beginning of chapter 6. And we're going to have five encounters. I encourage you to read it in your own time or listen to it. But for now, Jenny is going to set the scene by reading what followed immediately after Jesus had finished his day's teaching from the end of Mark 4. That evening... Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the east side. So they left the crowd and his disciples started across the lake with him in the boat. Some other boats followed along. Suddenly a storm struck the lake. Waves started splashing into the boat and it was about to sink. Jesus was in the back of the boat with his head on a pillow, and he was asleep. His disciples woke him and said, Teacher, don't you care that we're about to drown? Jesus got up and ordered the wind and the waves to be quiet. The wind stopped and everything was calm. Jesus asked his disciples, Why were you afraid? Don't you have any faith? Now they were more afraid than ever and said to each other, Who is this? 
Even the wind and the waves obey him. Well, thank you, Jenny. This first encounter, if you like, is a tiny mustard seed of a boat on the Sea of Galilee. I ask you, what kind of person sleeps in a storm that is soaking them and makes seasoned fishermen think they're going to drown? These fishermen are petrified and yet Jesus sleeps on. Well, either he is so exhausted he's ill or he is secure in the knowledge that all will be okay. The disciples in their panic did not read the situation in the same way. They thought that he didn't care. But when they managed to rouse him, he simply got up and with a simple rebuke, calmed the storm. The disciples went from being petrified of the storm to being terrified of the man. Even after all the teaching they had heard that day, the healings that they had seen, they asked, who is this that even the wind and waves obey him? And that is the key question for us. Who is this man? How we respond to this question will make the foundation of our faith and sets our expectations and hope. In this simple act, Jesus demonstrates that just as God had brought order out of the chaos as the Spirit hovered over the waters in Genesis 1, so Jesus brings order from the chaos in this storm of creation. It's not that he doesn't allow the storms, but that he is able to speak into them. Well, the next three encounters that Mark describes are notable in continuing to demonstrate Jesus' authority and the way the kingdom is taking root and spreading. The first encounter is Jesus' authority over demons. We've already had one exorcism in the temple in Mark 1, but now as the boat lands in Gentile territory, Jesus and the disciples are met by a man who lives outcast from the community among the tombstones. He's so strong that not even iron chains could hold him down. But as Jesus lands, the man runs and falls on his knees in front of Jesus as he yells out, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Well, what follows is an extraordinary account of Jesus asking the man his name. Legion, he replies, for we are many. Well, a legion in a Roman army is about 6,000. And when the spirits be beg to go into the pigs, Jesus releases them and 2,000 pigs squeal to their death. Well, I'm not exploring the animal rights, but this is a picture of how power was contained within this man. No wonder chains could not hold him. And yet, Jesus is able to subdue this power and release him from it. And by the time the town came out to see what had happened, here was the man, clothed and in his right mind. Perhaps you struggle with this story, and you may put it down to the man having mental health issues. But note how the man addresses Jesus as the son of the Most High God. Notice the authority that Jesus demonstrates. I have read recently that there are psychiatrists today who are coming to the realisation that there is a difference between mental health issues and spiritual. And a person needs treating holistically mind, body and spirit. It was with a simple word that Jesus released this man from a mighty power, enough to cause the death of many pigs. It was a word that brought peace and sound mind where nothing else had worked. The response was that the man wanted to be with Jesus, just like the disciples had been invited to do. But instead, in this case, Jesus sends him away to tell others about him. He is to be the one voice of faith among many voices of fear who pleaded with Jesus to go and leave. So again, there's more action, this time returning across the lake to Jewish territory. No storms this time, but there's another crowd to meet Jesus and amongst them is a synagogue leader. 
Despite the tensions we've seen so far between the religious leaders and Jesus, Jairus comes and just like the man possessed, he falls at Jesus' feet, honouring him. His desperation as a father overcomes his dignity as a synagogue leader. His daughter is dying and he pleads for Jesus to come to his house. Jesus agrees to go. Time is of the essence, but on the way there is another desperate person, a woman in the crowd. She'd suffered for 12 years from bleeding and the doctors could not heal her. The shame of her situation, though, meant she tried to do it in secret, just touching the hem of Jesus' garment as he passed by in the hope of healing and be remaining anonymous. But Jesus knows that power has gone from him and he stops. Despite the crowds pressing against him, despite the urgency for Jairus to get home before his daughter dies, Jesus stops and waits until the woman has the courage to come forward. And she too falls at Jesus' feet as she tells him what has happened. And Jesus affirms her, be freed from your suffering. Are you seeing a pattern emerging here? There's a storm that could not be managed by expert fishermen. A man possessed who could not be contained by force and human strength. A sickness that was about to end in death. A woman who could not be healed despite the doctors who had tried. All of these situations were beyond human control. And all three of the people who fell at Jesus' feet were unclean by Jewish law. A Gentile living amongst the dead. A synagogue leader, but with death in the house. A woman with an issue of blood. None of them in their current states could draw near in worship. And yet Jesus, the Son of God, reaches out to each of them. Even though it was too late, humanly speaking, by the time Jesus arrived at Jairus' house, he went in with Jairus, the mother, and three of the disciples, Peter, James, and John. And in that intimate setting, Jesus demonstrated he had authority over death as he took the girl's hand and told her to get up giving the disciples who had cried out in the boat yet another insight into his identity and another reason why they can have faith in him. Jesus calms the storm. He delivers the man and restores him to community. He heals the woman from her sickness and frees her from her shame. He raised the little girl to life. Who is this man who has authority over creation, authority over demons, disease and death? Through Jesus, the kingdom is coming to overturn the brokenness of this world and to restore God's rule, one situation, one person at a time, looking ahead to the cross and further ahead to the renewal and restoration of the whole creation that we wait for. And that is incredible. So the next event that Mark records is curious. At the beginning of chapter 6, Jesus returns to Nazareth and teaches in the synagogue. In verse 2, we read that many are amazed. They recognise his wisdom and acknowledge the miracles, but they're also cynical. They cannot see him as anything more than Mary's son, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas and Simon and his sisters, who they've known from birth. And they take offence at him. We've seen how Jesus has authority over creation, demons, disease and death. Yet in the context of people who refuse to see him as anything more than the bloke down the road, he is limited by what he can do. He healed a few people, but he was amazed at their lack of faith. Who is this man? We've seen the difference he makes. He calms, delivers, restores, heals, frees, raises up. 
These are the signs of the kingdom breaking into the broken world for people seeking hope. But I wonder if this last section is a bit of a wake-up call to us. Many of us within the church are old enough to have been brought up on the stories of Jesus. We've heard them so many times, they are familiar, perhaps a comfort to us. But I wonder if in the process there is a danger that Jesus has become like the bloke down the road. We think we know him because he has been part of our lives for so long. But he's more the cat on the mat in front of the fire rather than the lion that bounds from one place to another and roars in the kingdom. And we might even take offence when he comes to us in ways that we find hard to accept. We can lose sight of who he is when we are tested and overwhelmed by life. And many are feeling like that after the last two years, when we have just tried to keep going, but it has been exhausting. So what do we do when we wake up and realise that perhaps we've drifted or the storms of life are threatening to swamp us? Well, one thing we don't do is beat ourselves up. Jesus knows our frailties and limitations better than we do. He couldn't have stuck with the disciples for three years if he didn't. In Mark 3, when Jesus called the disciples, it was first simply to be with him to keep company with him, to learn by example. And I think he invites us the same. So how do we keep company with him? Learn to be in his presence and enjoy that company. Like two long-term friends or spouses, not needing to fill the air constantly with words, but having an ease in the silence. This is the prayer of being. The encounters that we've heard this morning all share one thing, that they sought Jesus for the life they couldn't get anywhere else. The calm, the peace, the deliverance, the wholeness, the freedom, the new life. The starting point is simply showing up. And like the synagogue leader, putting dignity aside and coming before Jesus, bowing before him, knowing our needs and being willing to be open to be vulnerable and to be honest and let Jesus do the rest. And if that feels too much, remember the mustard seed, that it is invasive. Once it gets in, it can't get out, it takes root. And if you are feeling like you can't hold on to Jesus, know that the kingdom is in you and it will not be uprooted by COVID, work or other stresses of life. And it may not look like much and it may feel like nothing is happening. But be sure the Lord of history continues to bring in the kingdom slowly, gradually, one person at a time. I'm going to give you some space now for your own response to Jesus. And you may want to let the video pause so you can pray as you feel comfortable. Our next song, We Bow Down, is a song that captures the heart of the demoniac, the synagogue leader and the woman. And we sing these words, we bow down. But what does that mean for you?
If you would like someone to pray with you or to talk about anything, then please get in touch. But as we close now, we close in these words from Jude. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Saviour be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. And may God bless you as you seek him. Salve!